Today our case brings us to Limerick, which is set in the province of Munster in the southwest of Ireland. Its compact old town is known for the medieval era. St Mary's Cathedral and St John's Square, which is lined with Georgian townhouses. Standing along the River Shannon, the 13th century King John's Castle is one of the city's most recognisable sites. Today it is a beautiful city and if you have a passion for the arts, a love of the great outdoors or an appetite for incredible food, Limerick really does have it all. But like all cities, there are places you avoid. This is especially prevalent in the time period of the 80s and 90s and right up into the early 2000s. This place was called My Ross. My Ross is a suburb and council estate in Limerick City and located on the city's north side and is the largest housing estate in Limerick. Housing development in the area began in the 1970s and 80s. It comprised of 1160 houses which were divided into 12 parks. My Ross would have been built for the poorer class of society and with this came trouble. The media would report antisocial behaviour, poverty and criminal gangs. The area gained notoriety with a decade-long cycle of incidents involving petrol bomb attacks, stabbings, murders and gun-related incidents which reached a peak in 2006. One incident that reached much media attention was the September 2006 petrol bomb attack of a car containing five-year-old Gavin and seven-year-old Millie Murray, which resulted in serious injuries to both of them. What was the reason for this attack, you might ask? Their mother turned down a request from youths for a lift to a courthouse. The Irish economy in the 80s and 90s wasn't great, and this was most notable in the areas that were poor already. Unemployment was high and no improvement in the economy in the rest of the country had much of an effect in areas like Myros. The poverty there worked hand in hand with increased crime rates. It was at this time that Limerick became known as Stab City. Knife crime was high and it was a term used by Dubliners who never missed an opportunity to look down their noses at anyone that lived outside Dublin, even the big cities like Limerick. But it was and is a term that the Limerick people do not want association with, and rightly so. That being said, the crime rates at this time were extremely high, especially in the Myros estate. Gardaí were called there constantly and no patrol car entered any part of the estate alone. There was a gang warfare which pitted one family against the other. While some people on the estate tried to keep their houses right, other parts were like a war zone, with boarded up houses and houses that had been burnt out. But the trouble here was generational and the children were just as tough as the adults. It was a survival of the fittest. The parents had to bring their children up tough, otherwise they would not survive. On the evening of Monday the 12th of July 1993, Tracy Butler, 17, was attacked at around 11.30pm. She had been on her way home to Craig Avenue in Killeley, an area southeast of Myros. The guardie investigating the scene showed that Tracy had been seriously injured and then chased into a green area. Her attackers then caught up with her and continued their assault. After Tracy was stabbed and beaten, she was rushed to Limerick Hospital where efforts were made to save her life. Unfortunately, the staff's efforts would be in vain as Tracy died an hour after she was admitted. After the discovery of Tracy, house-to-house inquiries were made. According to some, the attack was carried out by two people dressed in black, which wasn't much help. Before Tracy died, she would say the same thing. A post-mortem was carried out and it was reported that she had suffered 14 stab wounds to her chest, back and face, among other areas of her body. 49 injuries in total. Both lungs had been punctured, causing her lungs to collapse, along with two main arteries. It would later be confirmed that a Stanley knife, which is a box cutter to some of you, and a kitchen knife were used in the attack. It would be confirmed that Tracy died from shock and hemorrhaging. Gardy found the knives and dark clothes near to where Tracy was attacked. The clothes, which had been dumped, did not indicate whether they belonged to a man or a woman. By Wednesday evening, the Gardaí told the press that they were not ruling out 
that the attack may have been done by women. At this time, they also admitted that they were following a definite line of inquiry. In the wake of the attack, people in the area were horrified as crime rates in the area had come down, which was helping the image of Limerick, considering its reputation up to that time. A press conference was held and phone lines were set up asking people to ring in with any bit of information to help with the case. Investigators were trying to piece together the last hour of Tracy's life on that tragic Monday and the events that led to the brutal killing. Witnesses who had heard Tracy's screams during the attack got in contact with Gardaí and also people had reported seeing two people in dark clothing walking the road Tracy was attacked on. Tracy's mother also spoke to the press about her daughter. She said she was a good and lovable girl and knew of no reason why anyone would want to hurt her daughter. Mrs Butler also appealed to the public to help in bringing her daughter's attackers to justice. By Saturday the 17th of July, four women were arrested and brought in for questioning. The Gardaí had arrived at a home in Tipperary Town, 40 kilometres from Limerick just before 9am. These women were reported to be aged between 15 and 40 years of age. They were brought in to Henry Street Garda Station in Limerick. At 10pm that night, at a special sitting of the District Court, two women were charged with the murder of Tracy, 17-year-old Deborah Hannan and 24-year-old Suzanne Redden, both from My Ross in Limerick City. Deborah and Tracy had been childhood friends. Deborah's mother would say, quote, From the time they were in play school until the death of my husband, those two girls were inseparable. They both left primary school together and looked out for each other. They would fight on each other's behalf. The newspapers would report even more about their relationship. They would say they were best friends. The two used to go shoplifting together in the city centre, which Deborah was best known for. Another person who would be prominent in this case is Deborah's father, William Hannan. He was well known to the Gardaí and was seen as a troublemaker. He was a bodybuilder and known as a fighter and a bit of a womaniser. He tended to ignore his wife if she tried to intervene in any way on his lifestyle. Suzanne Redden got married at 18 to her husband Liam and the two 18-year-olds had leased a shop in My Ross from his parents. Suzanne had a child from a previous relationship before she married Liam and would go on to have two more children with him. When Suzanne began working in the shop in My Ross, she started to mix with the wrong crowd. She became friendly with Deborah's father, William, and she soon began an affair with him. She would end up breaking up with her husband, Liam, because of this affair. Despite the affair, Suzanne managed to stay friendly with the wife of the man she was having the affair with and struck up a friendship with the daughter, Deborah. Tracy was described by her family as a bright and bubbly girl. She had begun working at the St. Martin's Youth Centre months before her death, not far from her home. According to Gardaí, Tracy was known as a fighter. She was street smart and knew how to take care of herself and wasn't afraid to use aggression in order to protect herself and her friends. As I said before, you had to be tough to survive. Tracy's mother spoke about Deborah and her friendship with Tracy. She believed that Deborah was trouble and she wished she had kept Tracy away from her. She said she would not let Deborah into the house when she'd called for Tracy and she had warned Tracy to stay away from her. But the girls were childhood friends and so her warnings fell on deaf ears. Tracy and Deborah continued to hang around together and on occasion got into trouble. In early 1993, The two were picked up for shoplifting and sentenced to five months. Both appealed these convictions. The court was told that Tracy previously won her appeals and so won this appeal also. But Deborah had 19 previous convictions, which included an assault on a shop worker and so she was not successful. This was not a good thing as far as Deborah and Tracy's relationship. It would be said that this is where Deborah's grudge against Tracy began. It was reported that a feud in early 1993 led to Tracy's murder. There are different versions of what the feud was about, but one report read as follows. In the months before Tracy's death, there had been an argument over a spilt drink in the Savoy, 
where Deborah's father, William Hannon, was working. This escalated quickly and witnesses said it turned into a full-blown riot and was only brought to an end when Gardaí and riot gear were dispatched to the scene and got things under control. As a result of the riot, one man lost an eye and William was also injured that night. He had to have nine stitches in his face. Tensions afterwards were high between those who had been involved in the riot at the Savoy. Another report said that the trouble broke out after William was slagged off about the affair he was having with Suzanne Redden and he began throwing punches, which was said one of these punches landed on Tracy. Knives, blades, broken glasses and chairs were all used as weapons in the course of the row. It was reported that Suzanne was there that night also and she had been injured and needed stitches to her face. It was after this night that Tracy and Deborah had fallen out with each other and stopped talking. Four months after this night, William Hannon was jumped on by eight people who beat, kicked and battered him until he succumbed to his injuries. When this happened, Deborah had been serving out a sentence of 14 months in prison for shoplifting. She was granted compassionate leave to attend his funeral. Deborah and Suzanne believed that Tracy had been involved in the group that had attacked and killed William and bore some responsibility in the attack. At trial, it was said that Deborah and Suzanne suspected that Tracy had witnessed the attack on William 10 days before Tracy's own life was taken. It would be said later in court that even if Tracy had been present at the killing of William, there was no evidence that she took part. It was also said that Deborah and Suzanne had set out to attack and seriously injure or kill Tracy as a revenge for Deborah's father and Suzanne's lover, William. Deborah and Suzanne also admitted on several occasions that they had indeed attacked Tracy, so there was no denying it. The court was told that Tracy had been visiting two friends that night, two sisters that lived in Moy Ross. At 11.15pm she began her walk home to Kalili with a few of her friends. At around 11.30pm she separated from them to continue the rest of her journey home on her own. Several people would report that they had seen Tracy in the area as well as two people dressed in black, scuffling with cries for help coming from Tracy. Some people had recognised Tracy's voice as she cried out for help. A woman who lived nearby to where the attack took place told the court that she had been awoken to a knocking on her window. Her brother opened the door to Tracy, who was now visibly bleeding as she fell in through the doorway of the house. She stumbled into the house and fell onto the floor of the hallway. The man said her face was all cut and covered in blood. Another witness said he was walking along the road where the attack took place and came to the scene of three people fighting. One was calling for help while the other two dressed in black seemed to be attacking the girl. One of these two had the girl by the hair and the other came up behind and dropped something and picked it back up. He stated the item was a knife. It was then this person stabbed the girl crying for help five to six times. The girl had then fallen to the ground and the two in black ran away. He ran for help for the girl but in the meantime the girl had picked herself up and made her way to the house. There were many more witnesses that gave testimony about what they had seen that night and they all seemed to coincide with each other, even stating that it was two girls that attacked Tracy. After Deborah was arrested in Tipperary Town and a statement was taken by Gardy, it was stated by Deborah, quote, Planned all the time, Suzanne and myself, we planned to kill Mark or Sharon or Tracy. I blamed them for killing my father. I kept thinking about my father. We planned it after the funeral. The judge made it known to the jury that any statement made by either defendant could not be used against the other. Deborah's statement also said that it was her that had the Stanley knife and it was Susan that had the other knife and also admitted to wearing dark coloured clothes. Deborah had gone to the pub the night before armed with the Stanley knife in the hopes of meeting Sharon Butler, Tracy's sister, but Sharon was not out that night. So this is why both Deborah and Suzanne had gone out the night after in the hopes that Sharon would be out that night instead. They had waited outside a pub before the two of them started their journey home and came upon Tracy. When they approached Tracy, Deborah told her, quote, 
You are going down just like my father did. After the attack, Deborah and Suzanne ran back to Deborah's house and dumped their clothes at a neighbour's. Deborah said that she slept that night with knives under her bed as she was sure Mark, Tracy's brother, would come for her. Deborah had also called the Garda station the next day after hearing they wanted to speak to Tracy's friends. The Garda that interviewed her would go on to say that Deborah was as cool as a cucumber in the wake of Tracy's death. She told Gardy that she had not seen Tracy in months and then just walked out of the Garda station. Suzanne's statements to the Gardy was also read out in court. She told them she was a mother of three and had recently split up from her husband and had been in a relationship with William Hannan, Deborah's father, up until his death on the 4th of July. She also said William's wife was aware of the affair and that all three got on well. She told the Gardaí that she had been present on the day William was beaten to death. She had come on the scene when the fight was over and had found William lying on the ground. No one came to his aid and people were walking away, smirking and sneering as they did so. Tracy had been present also and Suzanne heard Tracy make comments as he lay bleeding on the ground. She said she felt very bitter towards the people that had beaten up William and those that were present and did nothing to help him. Suzanne did admit to leaving the house on the night in question. She said she had put a knife up her sleeve for protection, from whom she did not ever say. She also admitted to wearing dark clothes that night. She made out that when they met Tracy on the road, that Tracy had a smug look on her face, making faces and smiling at Deborah. The two women grabbed Tracy and dragged her across the road as they fought her. She would go on to say, quote, Deborah and I beat her up together. I got the knife and stabbed her in the chest at least once and then dropped the knife. I don't know whether I picked it back up again or Deborah did. It was then a man approached them and they ran. At the trial, Deborah's barrister did not call any witnesses or evidence. Suzanne's barrister tried to call medical evidence on her behalf. But the prosecution objected and after discussion, the evidence was deemed inadmissible. With that, the evidence portion of the trial was over. Closing took place the following day on Wednesday the 23rd of March 1994. The evidence was clear as far as the prosecution were concerned. Deborah and Suzanne had set out to kill or cause serious harm to Tracy on the night of the 12th of July 1993. Given that it was a joint enterprise, it didn't matter which had inflicted the fatal wound. Deborah's defence spoke, saying the only issue to be decided by the jury was intent. He said Deborah had been demented at the time of Tracy's death and the circumstances around her statement given to Gardy was oppressive and to find his client guilty of manslaughter and not murder. Suzanne's defence said that if the jury had any doubt in her having any intent of killing or causing serious harm, then they must find her guilty of manslaughter. He said she had been in a state of mind of emotional and mental confusion after the killing of William. In the judges summing up to the jury, he stated that they had three verdicts open to them. Guilty of murder, guilty of manslaughter and not guilty. There was no opening for diminished responsibility in Irish law and this could not be considered in their verdict. The jury of six men and six women went to retire to go over the evidence and come back with a verdict. They were also told that a majority of 10 to 2 would be accepted. Six hours later they would come back with their verdict. Both were found guilty of murder at a majority of 10 to 2. Suzanne didn't take the verdict well. She cried out and fell from her seat in the dock while her family tried to comfort her. Deborah, however, stood in the dock with no family around her throughout the trial. They had moved to the UK to try and get away from Limerick and the eyes of the nation. Tracy's family cried out in a whisper, yes. Her mother was unable to attend the trial due to illness. A life sentence was imposed on both women. Suzanne had suffered from depression since the murder of Tracy and was in the local mental hospital for treatment and so she would not start serving her life sentence until she was well enough. Sharon, Tracy's sister, spoke to reporters and said because of the bitterness they felt towards the two women who had murdered Tracy, they could not grieve because of this. But this was not the end. The next day, warrants were issued for the arrest of Sharon and Mark brother and sister to Tracy and an aunt of theirs. This was to have them bound to the peace. 
Mark had threatened to cut up one of Suzanne's children. This happened on the evening of the verdict when the two accused were being led through the four courts by prison officers. Sharon Butler also shouted the same thing about one of Suzanne's children. This totally freaked Suzanne out and she felt helpless in protecting her children. She kicked and wailed and had to be forced into the van that was bringing her back to prison. Deborah, on the other hand, had remained passive as equally vile things were shouted at her from the crowd. The warrants were issued and the three were brought before the courts. The judge said he understood the issues at play and accepted that the three knew what they did was wrong. He issued bonds that stated all three would keep the peace for three years and all three gave personal sureties to the amount of £150 and they promised to stay away from the families concerned. Much was said to the newspapers after the trial by family members. William, who was 33 at the time of his death, was a notorious womaniser during the course of his marriage to his wife Teresa. She said that one night the husband of one of William's women had come to the house. She had been in bed when William arrived home, telling her there was a man downstairs who wanted to talk to her. So she went down to see what this man wanted. The man then asked her if she was aware that her husband was having an affair with his wife. Her reply, quote, Well, what do you want me to do about it? I can't control him. At that, the man left. William began his affair with Suzanne in 1992 and would split his time with his family and Suzanne's home, often spending up to four nights a week with Suzanne. The affair began according to William's wife when the two would go swimming together. She said, quote, The next thing they were going swimming three nights a week. Then they were swimming every night for hours. Then they were swimming overnight and not coming home at all. Deborah, though, at first was not well pleased over this affair. More also came out over the attack on William the night he lost his life. On the night of the 2nd of July 1993, William and Teresa were on a night out. They were in a local pub and who did they bump into? Only Suzanne, the mistress. The three decided to walk home together through a nearby estate when eight men appeared and set upon William. It was reported that the two women were held down while William was getting a beating. When the crowd dispersed, Teresa ran away while Suzanne stayed with William, trying to comfort him. Suzanne claimed that Tracy had been there that night and was shouting and egging on the attackers. This allegation was strongly objected to by Tracy's family. They claimed that Tracy or any of the family were not there that night. They were in the area but did not see anything. It was all lies. When Deborah had been released from prison on compassionate grounds to attend her father's funeral two days later, it was at the funeral that she and Suzanne began talking about getting revenge. Deborah had told her mother that she was going to take revenge on any one of the Butler children. She didn't care which one. Teresa was worried and wanted to take Deborah to see someone to help her with her mental health. This never happened as just a few days later Tracy would be dead. After Tracy's death everyone locally seemed to know it was Deborah and Suzanne who killed her. Suzanne was falling apart and unable to keep it together. Everyone noticed the change in her. Suzanne not only feared the Gardaí, but she felt if the Gardaí didn't get to her, people wouldn't be long taking the law into their own hands. This is why Deborah and Suzanne left Limerick and went to stay with relatives in Tipperary, where they would eventually be arrested, and they confessed quickly. Tracy's mother was very bitter after the trial. She spoke to the newspaper saying how disgusted she was on how Suzanne's family rallied around her after the verdict. She said, quote, If that was one of mine who had killed an innocent girl, I wouldn't want anything to do with them again and I'd never recognise them again. Those two will only serve eight years. Is that justice? Pigs in a slaughterhouse wouldn't get a death like my daughter. Suzanne's family also spoke out saying they felt she was set up for the affair she had with William. They said Suzanne was a quiet and gentle woman and they can't understand how she got herself into such trouble and that she was not a murderer and they had no idea she was having an affair. They had seen William in her house and had met him and she always provided a valid reason as to why he was in her house. They also said that Suzanne was terrified of Deborah and after Tracy was murdered they asked her if she did it. 
She admitted to being there but hadn't taken part. Suzanne had put in an appeal after her conviction and her family were worried that it might be rejected and so worried about what she might do to herself. They also had sympathy for Tracy's family and were sorry for the pain they continued to suffer. As Deborah and Suzanne began their life sentence, three men had been charged with William's death. They secured an order that no reporting was to be done during the trial. 22-year-old Alan Duggan, 19-year-old Eric Ryan and 18-year-old John McGrath all admitted to assaulting, causing actual bodily harm. It was said that William was seen striking a woman and a group had chased after him with various instruments. It was said that the three were part of the group, but conflicting accounts left the DPP in a place where they couldn't charge them with murder, as there was no clear evidence of who gave the lethal blow. William died from a blow to the head, causing a fractured skull. Two of the three were sentenced to three and a half years each, taking away 11 months already served, and the judge suspended two years, leaving them with a seven-month sentence to serve. The third man received a two-year sentence. With time served and a year suspended, he walked free from court. In July 1995, the appeal on behalf of Deborah and Suzanne came before the Courts of Criminal Appeal. By December 1995, the judgment was delivered. Both appeals were refused. Deborah and Suzanne served out their sentence at the Docus Centre in Mount Joy. They shared their quarters with the black widow, Catherine Nevin, but they avoided her at all costs. Luckily, by the time she was convicted, both Suzanne and Deborah had secured day releases and so weren't spending as much time in prison. Eventually, they would both be released on licence. But Deborah didn't seem to adjust to the outside world like Suzanne had. Deborah would begin a pattern of breaking her licence conditions, getting caught drinking in the city centre with a well-known criminal. By 2002, both women were effectively free to live their lives permanently outside of prison walls. Both were working as hairdressers. Mrs Butler was horrified and thought nine years was not enough for her daughter's murder. After Tracy's murder, things did not improve in Limerick City. In fact, it got worse. In the early 2000s, the drug trade there was worth 30 million euro and there were two main families involved. Thankfully, though, they are either dead or in prison now. In the last decade or more, Limerick has had a revival. It is no longer seen as an unsafe place as far as cities go. My own daughter went to university there. She loved every minute of it. No matter the city, town, village or the country, bad things happen and only the people that have lost someone truly know the pain and it is little consolation to the families, especially when the Irish justice system continues to fail them. The Irish Prison Service have tried to release Deborah on at least six occasions, but she has been unable to cope with life outside the prison walls. Instead, she gets into trouble, particularly with alcohol, which violates the conditions that allow her to be on release. Lifers are released on licence but never officially end their sentence. They can be returned to prison at any time if they violate the terms of release. In one instance, Deborah moved to Rochdale, outside Manchester in northwest England in 2011 and had a baby boy there. However, she was returned to Docus Centre from the UK in August 2012, after allegedly being involved in a mass brawl, prompting her return to Ireland and imprisonment. She had been allowed to move to the UK on more than one occasion, as that is where most of her family live. The prison service has said when she is with them, she is a model prisoner. She seems to prefer her life there and its structure. She is what I guess institutionalised now and so is the longest serving female prisoner in Ireland as of September 2022.